Today we're going to talk about areas. Remember that definite integrals are calculating signed areas. We say signed areas for definite integrals to indicate that it might be plus or minus if there's, say, area under the x-axis, for instance. What we're going to do today is genuine areas. Every answer that we're going to come up with in this video will have a positive result. In order to find the area in between these two functions, from x equals a to x equals b, let's remember what the definite integral means. If I take the definite integral of the f function in between x equals a and x equals b, what will that give me? What does this symbol mean? The signed area in between the function and the x-axis. So that pink integral up there is giving me the total signed area inside this pink box. Now that's not the area I'm looking for. I'm looking for the area between the two curves, just from f to g. So what I'm going to do is subtract off the signed area on the g-curve, and that corresponds to the signed area between the g-curve and the x-axis. So when I subtract these two quantities, I'll be left with what I'm looking for. Remember that definite integrals are linear. So the definite integral of f minus the definite integral of g is the same thing as the definite integral of f minus g. This is helpful because if I subtract the functions first before I take the antiderivative, there could be some cancellations or some simplifications that happens when I subtract. And then I can take the antiderivative after that. Now, of course, the important thing for the formula on the previous slide was that you have to take the top function and subtract off the bottom function. Of course, the fact that I called this f and I called this g shouldn't affect the formula. So the way I like to write the formula is to say top function minus bottom function, then take the definite integral of the resulting quantity. Let's do an example. We're going to find the area in between the y equals x squared curve and the y equals 2x minus x squared curve. Notice that there's no mention of what the a and b values are. We're going to figure it out. Let's draw the y equals x squared curve. What does the graph of 2x minus x squared look like? That's the same thing as negative x squared plus 2x, so it must be a parabola downwards. And it crosses the x-axis. The height of the function is 0 if x is equal to 0 or if x is equal to 2. I'm looking for this area in here, inside the two curves. It's the 2x minus x squared that's on the top. So we're going to take the top function minus the bottom function. What are the a and b values wherever the two curves intersect? In order to find these x values, I'm going to set the two functions equal to each other and then solve for x. So I get 2x squared minus 2x equals 0. And finally, factor. The a value is x equals 0, and the b value is x equals 1. This is what we're going to calculate. Let's do it on the next slide. Take a careful look at what you're doing before you take the antiderivative. There's two x squareds in here, negative x squared and another negative x squared. It'll be to my advantage if I notice this and simplify it beforehand. That'll save me some work. Now I can do the power rule on each piece, then plug in my limits and subtract, and finally get the answer. So the answer here is a third. The area here we just calculated is a third. Next, we're going to find the area in between the sine and cosine curves. So here's cosine and here's sine. As you can see, if I look in between the two curves, I get a lot of area. This is why it's important in this problem that the x values are specified. Otherwise, we're going to have an infinite amount of area because there's a bunch of these little segments. We should go just from 0 to pi. One portion of the area is this little pizza slice. And then we have another area over here. The first piece has the cosine function on top and the sine function on the bottom. The second piece has the sine function on top and the cosine function on the bottom. So we're going to have to do this in two separate pieces. What is the x value that separates these two regions? What x value makes cosine of x equal to sine x? At the point in the middle here where the cosine graph hits the axis, that's the same point where the sine function hits its peak. Not the one we're looking for, but it's a start. This point is pi over 2. The point where they intersect 
is pi over 4. On a 45-45 right triangle, the sides of the triangle are 1, 1 square root of 2. Cosine of pi over 4, that's adjacent over hypotenuse, so that's 1 over square root of 2. If I take sine of pi over 4, that's opposite over hypotenuse, which is also 1 over square root of 2, right? So we see that if x is equal to pi over 4, sine and cosine are equal to each other. So finally, what are we doing here? We're going to take the definite integral from 0 to pi over 4. My top function is cosine, and my bottom function is sine. So that will give me the first piece. In order to get this second piece, I'm going to have to do a different integral. And of course, the second piece goes from pi over 4 up to pi. And in the second region, it's the sine function that's on top and the cosine function that's on the bottom. So let's calculate this. Because the definite integrals have different limits, and they also have different functions inside, this is cosine minus sine, this is sine minus cosine, there's no way to combine these two. The antiderivative of negative sine, remember that's cosine, the derivative of cosine is negative sine. I'm just going to keep integrating. So now I should plug in and subtract. Remember we plug in the top limit, and then we plug in the bottom limit, and we subtract. Similar over here. Remember that the cosine function starts at a height of 1. So cosine of 0 is 1. Cosine of pi over 4, if you remember, we figured this out a couple slides ago. That's 1 over square root of 2. Cosine of pi is negative 1. Remember the sine function starts at 0. Now since we've got minuses here, a minus times a minus, these just become pluses. We've got 4 1 over square root of 2. Here we have a minus minus 1, which is a plus 1 over here, and here we have a minus 1, so those guys cancel. So this is the area between the sine and the cosine function from x equals 0 to x equals pi. Let's do another one. We're going to find the area in between the absolute value function and x squared minus 1. So the area I'm looking for in between absolute value and x squared minus 1. Now because this graph is symmetric, what I can do is just find the area on the right hand side and then multiply it times 2. I don't have to write absolute value if all of the x's are positive, so I'm just going to write x. Now the function on the bottom is the x squared minus 1 function. Now what are the limits of integration? Clearly the left limit is 0, or the a is 0. What is this limit? The b value. Well, this is going to correspond wherever x is equal to x squared minus 1. So I should set x equal to x squared minus 1 and solve for x. Remember that in order to solve for x for a quadratic equal to 0, you can either factor or use the quadratic formula. This polynomial is not easy to factor, so I'll use the quadratic formula. The quadratic formula has given me two answers. Which one of these is my b value on the definite integral. If I mark, this is of course where the parabola goes through the axis. It looks like my b value must be 1 plus square root of 5 over 2. So my limits of integration here are 0 and 1 plus square root of 5 over 2. What's up with this other number? If we look at the full function y is equal to x, and look at the full function y is equal to x squared minus 1, what we can see is that there's two points of intersection. So this intersection point is 1 plus square root of 5 over 2, that's the one we want, and this intersection point over here, this happens at x is equal to 1 minus square root of 5 over 2, and that point is irrelevant for our problem. So now let's calculate this. Before I calculate it, I'm going to distribute that minus sign. That way I have less parentheses to deal with, and the simpler I can make it for myself, the better. So now I can do the power rule on each piece. Plugging in the top limit and the bottom limit. And finally, what am I missing? Don't forget to multiply the whole thing times 2. So this here is our final answer. And even though it's a bit messy, this is numerically exactly the area we were asked to find. We could do a bit of simplification, but I'm just going to leave the answer like this. Remember that we tend to leave things unsimplified unless we actually need the answer for a further calculation. So there you go. There's a few basic examples of calculating areas between graphs. 
We're going to do one more example, but this one's going to be a bit different. We're going to integrate with respect to y instead of with respect to x. Pay attention to the beginning of the example, which shows you the motivation for why we would integrate with respect to y instead of x. We're going to find the area in between this parabola and this straight line. What does this parabola look like? This is x is equal to negative y squared. Of course, this looks like a parabola going this way. No matter what the y value is, the x is always negative. And if I pick a single x value, that corresponds to two different y's. This line has slope 1 and y-intercept 2. The area enclosed is this area. If I integrate with respect to x, I'll have to separate into two pieces. Right at x is equal to negative 1, the region changes. So if we integrate this the usual way, we're going to have to separate it into two pieces. Straight line minus parabola and top parabola minus bottom parabola for the second region. So there's a different way to do this. Let's tilt our heads to the right and let's look at the parabola like it's on top and the line like it's on the bottom. And we do that by tilting our heads to the right as we look at this figure. From this different perspective, the top function is x equals negative y squared. And from this new perspective, I'm plugging in y values and getting x values out of the function. So here, it is essential that I have x as a function of y instead of y as a function of x. And now my bottom function, I'm going to move the equation around so that, again, I have x as a function of y. So over here, I'm going to have x is equal to y minus 2. So this change in perspective, tilting my head to the right, what that does is now I'm thinking of the y-axis as my input and the x-axis as my output. The integral I can calculate is the top function minus the bottom function and I'm going to integrate with respect to y. y is now what x was before. Now let's address the limits of integration. What should the numbers be? Well, these should be y values. Again, my head is tilted to the right, so I need to integrate from the minimum y value up to the maximum y value. Remember, we always put the lesser value on the bottom in, the, in a definite integral and the greater value on the top. So the lesser value of y, where the curves intersect, can be obtained by solving this equation. I'm going to set the negative y squared function equal to the y minus 2 function. This one is nicely factorable, and what I find out is that the two points of intersection are y equals negative 2 and y equals positive 1. We can see that on the picture. Over here, this is y equals negative 2, and over here, this is y equals positive 1. So these are my limits of integration, y equals negative 2 up to y equals negative 1. Now you can go ahead and compute this. Remember, distribute the minus sign first, then do the power rule on each piece. Try to keep your work as simple as possible. The final answer here is 4.5. So the area enclosed in this region is 4.5. So that's a brief introduction to areas. We're going to talk about some extra examples in class. So be sure to take a look at the book before you come to class.